بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started uh, introducing our speaker for today, Dr. Mohammed Rajabali. He is a longtime community activist, a lay speaker for Friday sermons at mosques across the Bay Area, and an active leader with two national groups that represent Muslim Americans. As an advocate for the poor and vulnerable, he founded a domestic violence shelter in the South Bay and serves as a member of the Tri-Cities Homeless Coalition. For the past decade, he also served as a human, rela human relations commissioner for the city of Fremont. As a religious leader, Dr. Rajavala has served since 2000 as a volunteer Muslim chaplain at Washington Hospital. He's the past president of the Islamic Society in Spain, Fremont, which is one of the Bay Area's largest mosques. That wasn't enough. He is. He's also a uh, operates a active dental practice in New York. So <laughs> I have this too. So <laughs> let me welcome uh, Dr. Rajapal. It all started in a cave, known as the cave of Hira. 
when Muhammad, peace be upon him, was in his holiness, and he knew something was wrong in the world that he lives. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> that he knew something was wrong, and you look at the people of his generation, of his age, they waste their time drinking, women, animals, and he, he knew there was something more to life, to the precious life. So he used to retreat in a, in a cave up the mountain. Seen the cave, I don't know seen the cave. So he used to climb that cave and stay there, you know, and stay there, with minimal provision. Very similar with Moses, peace be upon Right? <clears throat> so it is on one of those nights that the angel Gabriel appeared in front of him and asked him, read it. The actual tree. They read it. And the angel Gabriel came and tied him tight, like to break his chest more and let him go and say, repeat after me. And he, re he recited the first verse of the Quran that was revealed, chapter 96, 1 to 5. Read in the name of thy Lord. Read in the name of thy Lord. Read in the name, I'm paraphrasing, read in the name of, of your Lord, the most gracious, that has created everything, that has taught humans by the pen, but they do not. That, I said, five verses were given to him. Then this process continued, it stopped on and off for a period of 23 years. Now, <clears throat> I will talk a little bit about the compilation of the Quran, how it came into the form of book. By the way, I brought some 10 copies of the Quran. Please, I understand, you do not have enough last, last week. Please feel free to take them. And if you need more, you can contact me. I can hopefully, very happy to send you some more. So, there were two methods that the Quran was recorded. Two methods. Those methods were very precise, very consistent, the same one at the same time, in the same way, and very documented. The first one was memorization. Now, memorization was very integral to the Arab culture. The Arabs loved to memorize. That was the entertainment of the time. There was no TV, there was no social media. What they used to do gather in the tents and have music, have human dance, belly dancing. A lot of food, a lot of wine. They were drinking in those days. A lot of wine. <laughs> a lot of wine. And they would recite poems. Then it was, that was a culture. Beautiful Arabic language, beautiful Arabic poem. And that would start a war too, by the way. <coughs> if your poet come and insult me with his poetry, I'll fight you. Okay, that's what, that's what the tribal society, that's how it was. So, so memorization was with them. So when they had to memorize the Quran, it was in their culture. It was not something that they were not used. So they memorized the culture. It's ascribed that they would be with them, that they didn't really live with it. They would, as soon as they memorize it, he would tell them and make them memorize it. That was the first method. The second method was writing. They would write it down. Right there and then. They would write it on camel bones. They would write it on leather parchments. They would write it. So that we have two methods that if one was not sure, could check with the other. If I'm the one who memorized and I had some problem, I could go to you and say, you know what, I missed that part. Can you tell me what it is? You memorize it. You tell me. Right? About the other way around. If I wrote it wrong, I go back to you. Right? So we could, they had two ways of verifying. They had a memorization and they had a written. And we have always believed in that, that this was. But something came up in 2015 very recently, and that's like two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago. 2015, in the University of Birmingham, in UK, right? They had some manuscripts in their library, and they wanted to go and test this, uh, carbon test it, to know the age of that manuscript. And they did that together with the University of Oxford, at the Canterbury University, and they test carbon, they carbon tested the what they had. And they found out that those copies, they were copies of chapter 18, 19, 20, Tarot, belong to the time of Muhammad. This is the Ahmadim with an accuracy of 95.4%. That's amazing. That's amazing. We 
we have always been saying that, but we are very happy that this came out. Uh, showing and proving that what we were saying was always right. And those copies that they had in their possession were identical to what we had in the Quran today, in those chapters of 18, 19, 20. Right? But I just wanted to say that so that you, and, and after that, uh, this continued, and when, when, when after the death of the prophet, his biathani, his successors, would, it's a long process, I'm just, for time's sake, I'm just swimming right. Then they will start putting it, as they would call it, hit, parchment by parchment, whatever you had, whatever you had. Remember, it was a whole city of Medina at that. It's not just one person. It was a whole, and they would compare, and it, and do it. And later on, because people were from different parts, they would read the Arabic with different phonetics. Uh, I would you say tomato or tomato? Yeah. <laughs> Chicago or Chicago, right? It's like that. So what, what, what one of the successors, the third successor to Muhammad, his name was of man, he would uh, standardize and verify all the dialect reading that they would read in the same style that Muhammad is Biyabani, right? So that's the first question. I think you can talk a lot about it, but I think that's a brief thing. Now let's look at the second one. How Muslims look at the book, the Quran, and in their daily life. The first thing that you have to know that Muslim regards the Quran as a miracle. It's not only not just a book, but it's a miracle. Now all prophets, peace be upon them all, in Islam we do not differentiate. The Quran tells us do not differentiate among the prophet. By the way, any Arab Christian here? No, so don't you want me to read the Arabic, because otherwise I would read some Arabic. <laughs> so let's just read the English. Uh, Quran says, do not differentiate. Make no difference among the prophets of God. Uh, just listen and obey. That's what the Quran says. Okay? <clears throat> so, uh, it, we translate a living miracle because all prophets came to be miracle. That's what they have to prove themselves. Most of the prophets were common people. But some of them, Solomon, peace be upon him, was born with a silver spoon on the mouth. And not all the prophets. <laughs> the majority of prophets were just poor and old in Europe. I give you the example of Moses, peace be upon him, came to Pharaoh when he told Pharaoh, I am the messenger of God to you. So, what? what the hell are you talking about? That's what Pharaoh said. What the hell are you talking about? I know who you are. I raise you. I know what prophet are you talking about? What messenger are you talking about? And what God are you talking about? That's what he told him. He said, well, Pharaoh, do you, are you ready? I have something in store for you. <laughs> what did he produce? Huh? Anybody knows from the Bible of the Quran the same. What was the miracle of Moses? His rod, his staff. His staff, his rod. Right? So every prophet had that. We believe in that. Saying with mighty Jesus, peace be upon him. Jesus would just put his hand and pray. And the blind man would wake up and walk. Oh, mighty, mighty, mighty miracles. And they all did their miracles in the name of God. And all their miracles are locked in their time. They're locked in their time. If now I go to the Red Sea and I try to walk through it, I'll drown. <laughs> <laughs> I will drown, I will definitely drown. If I want to look at the blind man that Jesus speaks about him pure, and I say, come and have a cup of tea with me, tell me how it goes, how the process went. I can't find that blind man. Because all the miracles of the prophets were locked in their time, and we believe in all of them. Muhammad miracle is the Quran. Because he didn't know how to read. He didn't know how to write. His people was a people of language. I just told you, they used to recite poems. So he came with that mystery. He came with that miracle. That's why the Quran was challenged to the Arabs of those times. If you think this is human, if you think Muhammad composed it, then bring the best of your poets and try to match it. And they, they tried. They tried that challenge. And you know, one of them, I forgot his name, one of them came. Of course, they would pay them a lot of money to do that. And he came. He said, first I have to listen to what Muhammad is saying so that I can do the reply. When you listen to it, you came back to the head of the Quraysh. The Quraysh was the tribe of the Arabs, so the Quraysh. He said, hey, you're not believing what he says, fine, but leave him alone. This is not you. I can't give a reply to that. Well, 
at one of the cream of the poems. Okay? So, again, quickly we go through why Muslims believe that it is a miracle today. Why we believe that this is a miracle? Because he's the last prophet sent by God to humanity, his teaching remains. And that's why it is a, we believe it is. And there are other let, uh, reasons that I will give you around. One of them is the Arabic language. The Arabic language, today as we know it today, all the scriptures that we know, all the scriptures that we know, they exist in a dead language. It means a language that is not used in everyday use, which means documents are not written in it, letters are not written in it. If I attend a United Nations Security Council meeting on the channels of translation, I will not hear those. <laughs> That's what we call dead languages. They are studied, of course they are studied, they are still here. They are studied only for academic purposes. The Quran is a living language. We still hear it. The same way Muhammad, peace be upon him, spoke it. I told you, Assalamu alaikum. Letters are being written, documents are written, translation are being given. So that's what we say. Muslim believe even the Arabic language is a miracle of it. It was recorded during the lifetime of the Prophet. There was no oral tradition passed down from generation to generation, as we have seen the, the piece that we have seen from the uh, University of Birmingham. And it has not changed over 1,500 years. We don't give credit to the Saudis. We don't give to the Saudis. We're not too very happy with Saudis. So well, you need to know that. You need to know that. Our government supports those corrupted regime. The Arabs in that world, we are not. We want you to join us and we want to join you to express that. We do not. We are not happy that our government of the United States of America support those monarchies. You know, the biggest problem. So if the Quran did not change, it's not because of Saudi Arabia. It's because God Himself said it. We have, without doubt, sent down the Quran and will assuredly guard it from corruption. 15.9. Okay? <clears throat> it is the most read book in the world. Hadition. <coughs> Not only is it the most read book in the world, but you look at it in a particular time zone, it is the only book that gets read by so many people, the same part, the same page, the same thing. It's amazing. Uh, if you imagine, you are a different timeline. When I look at the, we are at around 12 now, 12, the country where I was born from, off the coast of South Africa, it's midnight there, right? So you have different time zones, but in each particular time zone, hundreds, thousands of people are reading the same thing. And then when you get into month of Ramadan and so on, it's been amazing, all right? But perhaps most important of that is, it contains, uh, before I get that, there is a, so again I speak about the Arabic language, there's something called half a Hufaz, half is in Arabic, means the memorizer, the one who memorized the Quran. That's itself is a miracle. I'm not a half is, I have memorized quite a good part of the Quran, but I did not memorize it from the first to the last. Okay? But you'll be amazed how many <coughs> people memorize it from the first song to the last one. You know, they were just eight years old, seven years old, nine years old. It's amazing. I mean, you ask any. You take the children, and we're in America, we use America. You know the children in America. Especially now, this generation, they, are, they speak English in the house. Right? Because they are second and third generation. We settle quite a bit, we settle very much to speak English in the house. I always spoke English in the home because me and my wife don't speak the same language. So we always speak, we speak English. But, but many, but many uh, I remember when I went to high school to put my son in and he said, what, what language do you speak at home? I said, English. She looked at me. Said, you speak English? <laughs> I said, yes, I do. <laughs> but, <clears throat> so the half is amazing. I mean, you give a child a book of more than 6,000 verses, 114 chapters in a language that he doesn't know. In a language that he doesn't understand. In a language that his parents don't use at home. And he said, go ahead and memorize it. And they do it in one and a half or two years. That's amazing. Try that in Russia, try that in Chinese, try that in Tagalog, try that in any language, Urdu, Hindi. So this is what we say that is a miracle in that language. Okay. Now, 
the other thing that we have now, most, this is most, uh, now what I have is most scientific. It contains information. The Quran contains information that was not known to human when it was revealed 1500 years ago. There are many of them, from the world being ground, from the planets orbiting. I'll remind you that the Muslims in Spain got that, gave it to, the, to Spain, and that's what led to the age of discovery of Magellan, Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus used the maps of, anybody knows? His name was al Idris from Spain. Okay. But perhaps to get more recent here, I'll give the case of Dr. Keith Moore. Dr. Keith Moore. Dr. Keith Moore is an embryologist and an anatomist, head of the department in Canada. School of Medicine, I think in Toronto or somewhere. All these are online, you can check it again. Okay? <coughs> Keith Moore, you look at the Quran and you look at the science of embryology. The science of embryology is a new science. It talks about the development of the, of the baby in the uterus of the mother. And this came only after the development of the electron microscope. It's a brand, pretty branch new science. When Dr. Keith Moore looked into the Quran about the development of the fetus, he was shocked. He was surprised at the precise description, anatomical precise description. And he published a paper, I have the name of the paper here, he published uh, a scientific interpretation of the references to embryology in the Quran. Okay. <clears throat> he was shocked. He said, there's no way Muhammad could have gone. So there is no human in the world at that time at this knowledge. And they asked him, well, do you believe the Quran is human? He said, no. <coughs> so they asked him further, are you, are you willing to become a Muslim? He said, no, I'm happy as a Christian. <laughs> but I will respect the Quran. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the message I have for you. That's the message we want to have for America, for our fellow Americans. Know the Quran for what it is. It is not about conversion. We are not in the business of conversion. God guides what He wants. We are not in the business of conversion. But if you know what the Quran is, then you will be, there will be more like Dr. Keith Moore. There will be more Dr. Professor John Esposito. There will be more Karen Armstrong. When you will respect the book, you won't burn it. God forbid. You won't burn it. Uh, and you would respect its adherence. That's what it's all about. Okay, and I give you another example of Dr. Maurice Bukai. Sorry. <laughs> so again, thank you all for coming. Um, a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, one is um, we received the link from the speaker last week. Um, the presentation was recorded and it's on YouTube. Um, so I'll be forwarding the, uh, the link to the office so they'll be able to post it on the website. I also received from the speaker the list of the books that he uh, that he described at the end of the presentation last week. So we'll be posting those as well. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started uh, introducing our speaker for today, Dr. Mohammed Rajabali. He is a longtime community activist, a lay speaker for Friday sermons at mosques across the Bay Area, and an active leader with two national groups that represent Muslim Americans. As an advocate for the poor and vulnerable, he founded a domestic violence shelter in the South Bay and serves as a member of the Tri-Cities Homeless Coalition. For the past decade, he must have served as a human, rela human relations commissioner for the city of Fremont. As a religious leader, Dr. Rajavala has served since 2000 as a volunteer Muslim chaplain at Washington Hospital. He's a past president of the Islamic Society of Spain and Fremont, which is one of the Bay Area's largest mosques. If that wasn't enough, he is. He's also a, uh, operates a active dental practice in New York. So, <laughs> I have this too. So, let me welcome Dr. Rajavala.
ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I greet you with peace. Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. Thank you for this beautiful introduction. Here. 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 So, peace be with you on this beautiful Sunday, and I just want to start by thanking the organizers. Thank you for having us here. It's our honor and privilege. Honor, we feel very honored to come here and to take time from your service time and to give it to us so that we could have a sensible dialogue and a talk. My worries are about, I heard last week the ball was raised very high. <laughs> <laughs> he's a good friend of mine, I come from that. Uh, thank to God, he's a good friend of mine. I have a lot of respect for him. So I hope I don't disappoint you this morning. Uh, I've been asked to talk about the Quran, and it's, uh, I'm going to try to do something almost impossible, a lifetime study in one hour. <laughs> so I'm right? And uh, I talk a lot to, to, to Peter Freeman, and we talk about it, but I, when he told me what it is, I gathered the information, and I said, if I answer three questions, maybe we could cover the whole thing, if I answer three questions. The question number one is, what is the Quran? What is it and how it came the way it is today? Maybe that's the first question. The second question is how important is the Quran to Muslim? How they look at the Quran, especially in their everyday life. That's number two. And number three is what are the common personalities, the biblical and Quran personalities that are common? And we can perhaps look at that. And any question, any time, please just I understand we'll have a question and answer session afterwards. But if you have a question outside those three questions that I'm going to ask, please feel free to ask. So your questions are not limited to the, 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 the questions that I will answer. All right. And a couple of things before I start in the Islamic tradition. Uh, we always praise God before we start something. And every time we mention the name of any prophet, we will say, peace be upon him or multiple peace be out of them. So you will hear me saying that a lot. And so let's get how the Quran is. What is the Quran? Technically, the Quran is the last revelation that Muslims believe that God revealed to humankind. All right? So we have God, the author of the Quran, the same God of Abraham, the same God of Moses, the same God of Jesus, peace be out of them reveal the Quran. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the recipient of the Quran. And how did he come through? Angel Gabriel. So Muslims believe that the Quran was is the words of God given to Gabriel and on to Muhammad. Peace be upon him. It always started in a cave, known as the cave of Hira. When Muhammad, peace be upon him, was in his forties, and he knew something was wrong in the world that he lives. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> that he knew something was wrong. And you look at the people of his generation of his age, they waste their time drinking, women, gambling, and he, he knew there was something more to life, to the precious life. So he used to retreat in a in a cave up the mountain. I've seen the cave, I don't know, I've seen the cave. So he used to climb that cave and stay there, you know, and stay there, with minimal provision. Very similar with Moses, peace be upon right? <clears throat> so it is on one of those nights that the angel Gabriel appeared in front of him and asked him to read it. The apple tree. He read it. And angel Gabriel came and tied him tight, like to break his chest more and let him go and say, repeat after me. And he, re he recited the first verse of the Quran that was revealed, chapter 96, 1 to 5, to read in the name of thy Lord. Read in the name of thy Lord. Read in the name, I'm paraphrasing, read in the name of your Lord, the most gracious, 
that has created everything, that has taught humans by the pen, but they do not. That, I said, five verses were given to him. Then this process continued. It stopped on and off for a period of 22 years. Now, <clears throat> I will talk a little bit about the compilation of the Quran, how it came into the form of a guide. By the way, I brought some 10 copies of the Quran. Please, I understand. You do not have enough last, last week. Please feel free to take them. And if you need more, you can contact me. I can hopefully very happy to send you some more. So, there were two methods that the Quran was recorded. Two methods. Those methods were very precise, very consistent, the same manner, and the same time, in the same way, and very documented. First one was memorization. Now, memorization was very integral to the Arab culture. The Arabs loved to memorize. That was the entertainment of the time. There was no TV, there was no social media. What they used to do gather in the tents and have music, have human dance, belly dancing, a lot of food, a lot of wine. They were drinking in those days, a lot of wine. A lot of wine. And they would recite poems. Then it was, that was a culture. Beautiful Arabic language, beautiful Arabic poem. And that would start a war too, by the way. <coughs> if your poet come and insult me with his poetry, I'll fight you. Okay, that's what that's what the tribal society, that's how it was. So so memorization was with them. So when they had to memorize the Quran, it was in their culture. It was not something that they were not used. So they memorized the culture, is ascribed that will be with him, that they can really live with it. They would as soon as he memorize it, he would tell them. They can memorize it. That was the first method. The second method was writing. They would write it down. Right there and then. They would write it on camel bones. They would write it on leather parchments. They would write it. So that we have two methods that if one was not sure, could check with the other. If I'm the one who memorized and I had some problem, I could go to you and say, you know what, I missed that part. Can you tell me what it is? You memorize it. You tell it. Right? About the other way around. If I wrote it wrong, I go back to you. Right? So we could they had two ways of verifying. They had a memorization and they had a written. And we have always believed in that that this was. But something came up in 2015, very recently, and that's like two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago. 2015 in the University of Birmingham in UK. Right? They had some manuscripts in their library, and they wanted to go and test this uh, carbon tested to know the age of that manuscript. And they did that together with the University of Oxford at the Canterbury University, and they test carbon. They carbon tested the what they had, and they found out that those copies, they were copies of chapter 18, 19, 20, carbon, belonged to the time of. Is the with an accuracy of 95.4 percent. That's amazing. That's amazing. We have always been saying that, but we are very happy that this came out, uh, showing and proving that what we were saying was always right. And those copies that they had in their possession were identical to what we have in the Quran today, in those chapters of 18, 19. Right? But I just wanted to say that so that you, and, and after that, uh, this continued, and when, when, when after the death of the prophet, his beatening, his successors, would, it's a long process, I'm just, for time's sake, I'm just swimming right. Then they would start putting it, as they would call it, hit, parchment by parchment, whatever you had, whatever we had. Remember, it was a whole city of Medina, that. it's not just one person. It was a whole, and they would compare, and hit it, and do it. And later on, because people were from different parts, they would read the Arabic with different phonetics. Uh, like you say, do you say tomato or tomato? Yeah. <laughs> Chicago or Chicago, right? It's like, like that. So what, what, what one of the successors, the third successor to Muhammad, his name was Uthman, he would be uh, standardized and verify all the dialect reading that they would read in the same style that Muhammad is Biyabani. Right. So that's the first question. I think you can talk a lot about it, but I think that's a brief thing. Now let's go to the second one. 
how Muslims look at the book, the Quran, and in their daily life. The first thing that you have to know that Muslim regards the Quran as a miracle. It's not only not just a book, but it's a miracle. Now all prophets, peace be upon them all. In Islam we do not differentiate. The Quran tells us do not differentiate among the prophets. By the way, any Arab Christian here? No, so don't need for me to read Arabic, because otherwise I'll be reading some Arabic. <laughs> so let's just read in English. <laughs> Quran says do not differentiate. Make no difference among the prophets of God. Uh, just listen and obey. That's what the Quran says. Okay? <clears throat> so, uh, it, we translate a living miracle because all prophets came to be a miracle. That's what they have to prove themselves. Most of the prophets were common people. But some of them, Solomon, peace be upon him, was born with a silver spoon on the mouth. And not all the prophets. <laughs> the majority of prophets were just poor and old in Europe. I give you the example of Moses, peace be upon him, came to Pharaoh when he told Pharaoh, I am the messenger of God to you. So, what? what the hell are you talking about? That's what Pharaoh said. What the hell are you talking about? I know who you are. I raise you, I know you. What prophet are you talking about? What messenger are you talking about? And what God are you talking about? That's what he told him. He said, uh, Pharaoh, do you, are you ready? I have something here in store for you. <laughs> what did you produce? Huh? Anybody knows from the Bible of the Quran the same. What about the miracle of Moses? His rod, his staff. His staff, his rod. Right? So every prophet had that. We believe in that. Same with mighty Jesus, peace be upon him. Jesus would just put his hand and pray. And the blind man would wake up and walk. But mighty, mighty, mighty miracles. And they all did their miracles in the name of God. And all their miracles are locked in their time. They're locked in their time. If now I go to the Red Sea and I try to walk through it, I'll drown. <laughs> <laughs> I will drown, I will definitely drown. If I want to look at the blind man that Jesus speaks about him cured, I say, come and have a cup of tea with me, tell me how it goes, how the process went. I can't find that blind man. Because all the miracles of the prophets were locked in their time and we believe in all of them. Muhammad miracle is the Quran. Because he didn't know how to read. He didn't know how to write. His people was a people of language. I just told you, they used to recite poems. So he came with that mystery. He came with that miracle. That's why the Quran was challenged to the Arabs of those times. If you think this is human, if you think Muhammad composed it, then bring the best of your poets and try to match it. And they, they tried. They did try that challenge. And, you know, one of them, I forgot his name, one of them came. Of course, they would pay them a lot of money to do that. And he came and he, he said, first I have to listen to what Muhammad is saying so that I can do the reply. When you listen to it, he came back to the head of the Quraysh. The Quraysh was the tribe of the Arabs, it's called the Quraysh. He said, hey, we're not believing what he says, fine, but leave him alone. This is not human. I can't give a reply to that. Well, that's one of the cream of the poem. Okay. So, again, quickly we go through why Muslims believe that it is a miracle today. Why we believe that this is a miracle? Because he's the last prophet sent by God to humanity. His teaching remains. And that's why it is a, we believe it is. And there are other le 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 reasons that I will give you around. One of them is the Arabic language. The Arabic language. Today, as we know it today, all the scriptures that we know, all the scriptures that we know, they exist in a dead language. It means a language that is not used in everyday use, which means documents are not written in it, letters are not written in it. If I attend a United Nations Security Council meeting on the channels of translation, I will not hear those. That's what we call dead languages. They are studied, of course they are studied, they are still here. They are studied only for academic purposes. The Quran is a living. We still hear it. The same way Muhammad, peace be upon him, spoke it. I told you, Assalamu alaikum. Letters are being written, documents are written, translations are being given. So that's what we say. Muslims believe even the Arabic language is a miracle of it. 
It was recorded during the lifetime of the prophet. There was no oral tradition passed down from generation to generation, as we have seen the, the piece that we have seen from the uh, University of Birmingham. And it has not changed over 1,500 years. And we don't give credit to the Saudis. <laughs> Saudis. We're not too very happy with Saudis. So well, you need to know that. You need to know that. Our government support those corrupted regime. The Africans in that world. We are not. We want you to join us and we want to join you to express that. We do not. We are not happy that our government of the United States of America support those monarchies. They are the biggest problem. So if the Quran did not change, it's not because of Saudi Arabia. It's because God himself said it. We have without doubt sent down the Quran and will assuredly guard it from corruption 159. Okay? <clears throat> it is the most read book in the world. Hadishun. <coughs> Not only is it the most read book in the world, but you look at it in a particular time zone. It is the only book that gets read by so many people, the same part, the same page, the same page. It's amazing. Uh, if you imagine you a different timeline. When I look at the, where are I now? 12 now, 12. The country where I was born from, off the coast of South Africa, it's midnight there, right? So you have different time zones. But in each particular time zone, hundreds, thousands of people are reading the same thing. And then when you get into month of Ramadan and so on, it's been amazing, all right? But perhaps most important of that is it contains, uh, before I get that, there is a, so again, I speak about the Arabic language. There's something called half of Hufaz, half is in Arabic, means the memorizer, the one who memorized the Quran. That's itself is a miracle. I'm not a half is, I have memorized quite a good part of the Quran, but I did not memorize it from the first to the last. Okay? But you'll be amazed how <coughs> people memorize it from the first line to the last line. You know, they were just eight years old, seven years old, nine years old. This is amazing. I mean, you ask any. You take the children, and we're in America, we use America. You know the children in America. Especially now, this generation, they, have, they speak English in the house. Right? Because they are second and third generation. We settled quite a bit, we settled very much to speak English in the house. I always spoke English in the home because me and my wife don't speak the same language. So we always speak, speak English. But, but men, but men uh, I remember when I went to high school to put my son in it. He said, what, what language do you speak at home? I said, English. She looked at me. Said, you speak English? <laughs> I said, yes, I do. <laughs> but, <clears throat> so the half is amazing. I mean, you give a child a book of more than 6,000 verses, 114 chapters, in a language that he doesn't know. In a language that he doesn't understand. In a language that his parents don't use at home. And he said, go ahead and memorize it. And they do it in one and a half or two years. That's amazing. Try that in Russia, try that in Chinese, try that in Tagalog, try that in any language, Urdu, Hindi. So this is what we say that is a miracle in that language. Okay? Now, the other thing that we have now, oh, this is more, uh, now what I have is more scientific. It contains information. The Quran contains information that was not known to humans when it was revealed 1500 years ago. There are many of them, from the world being ground, from the planets orbiting. I'll remind you that the Muslims in Spain got that, gave it to, the, to Spain, and that's what led to the age of discovery of Magellan, Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus used the maps of, anybody knows? His name was Al Idris from Spain. Okay? But I have to get more recent here. I'll give the case of Dr. Keith Moore. Dr. Keith Moore. Dr. Keith Moore is an embryologist and an anatomist, head of the department in Canada, School of Medicine, I think in Toronto or somewhere. All these are online, you can check it again. Okay? <clears throat> Keith Moore, you look at the Quran and you look at the science of embryology. The science of embryology is a new science. It talks about the development of the, of the baby in the uterus of the mother. And this came only after the development of the electron microscope. It's a brand, pretty brand new science. When Dr. Keith Moore looked into 
the Quran about the development of the fetus, he was shocked. He was surprised at the precise description, anatomical precise description. And he published a paper, I have the name of the paper here, he published uh, a scientific interpretation of the references to embryology in the Quran. Okay. <clears throat> he was shocked. He said, there is no way Muhammad could have known that this He said, there is no human in the world at that time had this knowledge. And they asked him, do you believe the Quran is human? He said, no. <coughs> they asked him further, are you, are you willing to become a Muslim? He said, no, I'm happy as a Christian. <laughs> but I will respect the Quran. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the message I have for you. That's the message we want to have for America, for our fellow Americans. Know the Quran for what it is. It is not about conversion. We are not in the business of conversion. God guides whoever he wants. We are not in the business of conversion. But if you know what the Quran is, then you will be, there will be more than like Dr. Keith Moore. There will be more Dr. Professor John Esposito, there will be more Karen Armstrong. When you will respect the book, you won't burn it. God forbid. You won't burn it. And, and you will respect its adherence. That's what it's all about. Okay, and I give you another example of Dr. Maurice Bukai. Anybody heard of An amazing book. And they, all those people wrote those books when they were not Muslim. And Dr. Keith, Keith Lewis, still not Muslim, but I don't know. I, I don't know about Dr. I met him, by the way, he influenced my own Iraq. I was my own. I was born from Muslim parents, but I went through my own surgery. And at that time of my life, when I met Dr. Moses Dukai, uh, it was very, very crucial time for me. Uh, and uh, I look at religions, and I eliminated, 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 and I came to two. You could either be a Christian or a Muslim. <laughs> and Moses Bukai was a big contributing factor. <coughs> I read that book, Quran, by the way, science. It, it, it was amazing. Uh, it talks about a lot of things. Fingerprinting. Fingerprinting. Quran talks about fingerprinting, identifying every one of us. This is amazing. You know, the fingerprinting is 75. I was talking to a group of doctors at Washington. And I told them Alzheimer is in the Quran. They look at me, I think yes. Alzheimer is in the Quran. So at each generation, as science makes advancement, we interpret the Quran. We see it is in the Quran. See, we have no problem with the evolution. We have no problem. Not everything that Darwin says is correct. We take a lot of objections from Darwin. We are not apes. But many things he said is in the Quran. Many things Darwin said. We have the problem. In all Islamic schools, they teach evolution because two words in the beginning of the Quran, the word Rab, Adam, this is the first verse of the Quran. Rab means somebody who creates something and make it grow to its maximum potential. That's evolution. That's evolution. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, let me go to the second part how the Quran helps Muslims in their everyday life. The Quran is, is, is a guide. It guides the Muslim. It, the Quran is a book that tells us who is God. Also, you'll be surprised. I asked this question to a teenager the other day who was talking to me. I said, who is God? He said, you know what? I never asked this question. People don't know who is God. But the Quran tells us who is God. You know, 2, 155. You know, and there are many verses of the Quran I don't have time to go in. But it tells you who is God, that he's one, that he's closer to us than our juggle of veins, the juggle of veins deep root to in the neck, he's not close to you. He tells us, don't repeat the mistake of your father, Adam. He warns us, please, all human beings, the Quran address human beings, not Muslims, that's what perhaps a lot of people don't know. Right? The Quran addresses human beings. There are some verses specific to Muslim. How you pray, how you fast, yes. That's only for Muslim. Right? But the others, humanity. Addresses human, yeah, you are nasty in Arabic. People. And when you address a Muslim, yeah, you are living in the Amman. Is a 
difference in Arabic about the, about the address of the Quran. So he tells us, don't fall like your father for, for Satan. And then he tells us, if ever you fall, know I am merciful. Know that I love to forgive, and if you ask me, I will forgive you. Straight right on. He asks us to believe in your life to come. And to do whatever best we can with our deeds for that life to come. He tells us we will be responsible for our action. And that put a sense of responsibility and accountability on me. And that's what changed my life. I grew up in the 60s, you can imagine what that is. <laughs> okay, I was a typical one, right? I don't want to do too much detail. <laughs> right? But I grew up in a small France. Where I lived, it was a small Paris, okay? In the island of Mauritius, okay? The city of Paris. So, <clears throat> where was I? So he tells us, you fall down, you commit mistakes, you just turn to me. On your cell phone, direct. <laughs> direct, just call me, say, oh God, oh my father, is a beautiful prayer that I had, peace be upon him, our father, say, say, oh my Lord, I have wronged myself. Forgive me and save me, be hard, otherwise I'll be on the losers. And that's a prayer that will repeat so many times. Alright? So it is the guide, that's what gave guides. He tells us in the book of the Quran to uplift the poor. To be with, the, with, with those who are in the, in, 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 in the pitch darkness of poverty, of suffering, of pain. You have, been, you have heard in, in, in my intro that I. I served, I served because of my duty to humanity. And when he says take care of the orphan, he doesn't say Muslim orphan. He says orphans of humanity. And he says help the weak, he says the weak of humanity. Right? So that's the, the, the moral values, the core values, the family values, respect your parents. Once a man asked the Prophet, is the Avani, who is the one I should love more after God and after you? He said, Your mother. <laughs> the man asked a second time. He said, Your mother. The man asked a third time. He said, Your mother. <laughs> then he said, Fourth time before. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> We all been told that the, the paradise is not killing innocent people. This is a manufacture and maker. It isn't. We are told that paradise lies beneath the feet of your mother. Serve your mother. That's your key to your paradise. <coughs> so, <coughs> it also respect diversity. 49.13. I guess after Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, read this verse. The message that he visited. This is the verse that we need to know. Know that I have created you from one male and female and make you into tribes and nations that you understand each other, that you do not despise each other. The most pious among you is the one who is closest to God. And look at that criteria. Who is closest to God? The one who is more pious. Can you wave that? And you with that on a scale, who is more pious? No. That's up to him. That's up to him, not up to me, to you, to anybody who decide who is more pious. And that's the verse of diversity. The Quran calls upon us to look at the animals, to look at the color of our skin, the different languages that you speak, so that you respect diversity. The Quran calls upon us to look at the stars and the moon and reflect. To reflect on the creation and say there could not be other God than I am. And he's only one God. Because they would fight if there were two or three gods. We get into the mythology, the Greek mythology, or of the Hindu, the way you have fights of God. Mighty gods fight down for themselves. And God says, No, there's only one God. I control this whole universe. Look at it. And I had a man who talked to me the other day, an atheist was trying to, when I said, it's a friendly conversation, I don't plan to talk a lot to you, but I'll tell you only one question. 
I think I believe there is one God. I believe that God raised the sun in the east every day and made it set in the west. You believe there is no God. Do you have any other power that can make that sun raise in the west? If you can't do it, then you will prove me wrong. If you can't prove me wrong, then that's it. Case closed, y'all. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. There's something to say, but uh, 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 that's a very important call us to reflect 2164. It's a beautiful verse of 2164. It's a beautiful verse that calls us to reflect at the, at the unisense in nature of the universe. And you see, we can't see God, but we can see the signs of God. It's the sign of creation of God. And I think I will take the last one. I will rush a little bit because I want to hear from you. I want to have your questions. Okay. Uh, the last one is the Quran. Uh, how does the Quran uh, in relation to the biblical uh, personalities that we know? Well, to understand that, we just go back to a couple of verses of the Quran where the Quran clearly says that it is a book that confers previous revelation. It is a book that confirmed previous revelation. You have 2, 97, 3, and 3, 5, and 14. I hope you're following when I say those numbers. The first number is the chapter, the second number is the verse. Okay? It's 297, 3, 3, and 5, 48. There are many others, I just kept three. Of course, that's why we have to believe in all the prophets. As a Muslim, I have to believe in the Torah. I have to believe in the Psalm of David. I have to believe in the gospel of Jesus. And peace be upon the Lord. I can't say I'm a follower and believe in the Quran and I deny all those books. I am not a Muslim. Mm. Right, so the Quran can <coughs> confirm those. Okay, that's very important. So you have a lot of figures that have come, especially those powerful messages like Abraham. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, called Abraham, peace be upon him, my father. My father, you. Okay? Abraham. Moses, Jesus, are very, very frequently mentioned in the Quran. A whole chapter of the Quran is named after the father of Jesus, Mary. You don't see a chapter of the Quran after the mother of Muhammad, who is Amina. You don't. But you see a chapter. We believe. Right? So you have to understand that. There are some others who are less spoken of. Enoch, I think, is mentioned only once or twice. Peace be upon him. Uh, Log is mentioned quite a bit also. Uh, peace be upon him. Noah, peace be upon him. You know, like all those are mentioned. Joseph, powerful, powerful story. Joseph, peace be upon him. So, if you look at it, there may be some variation. But in principle, there are stories, there are life stories of those prophets. With some, between, of course, the obvious, obvious difference would be the, the status of Jesus. Peace be upon Allah. Muslim in the Quran tells us he is a mighty prophet of God. But we need to know that we believe in his miraculous birth. We believe that he was miraculously born. And that's why in our Quran, whenever Jesus is mentioned, peace be upon him, who else is mentioned, if anybody can guess? John the Baptist, peace be upon him. John the Baptist, because the Quran tells both a miraculous birth, and it is the God's power to create, he creates whatever he wants, with whatever he has, whatever he wants, whatever he wills. In Arabic it's a kun fire kun, be and it is. So that's why always, most of the time, the story of John the Baptist and Jesus, peace be upon them, are mentioned simultaneously. A lot of similarities between the Moses and, and their, their, how they fight the enemies, how they will be put in exile, how they come back victorious, Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon them. Okay? So that basically uh, tells us that all those personalities have come to the Quran and come up to the Bible as we know it today. And with differences, you know, for example, I think in the Quran it is the wife of Pharaoh that believes in Moses, peace be upon them. I'm not sure, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, unless it is Hollywood depiction, <laughs> I think it is his sister that believes in, in, the, in, the, what do you call it, in the in the in the mission of, of Moses. So I was end here, I'll stop here, and any question is feel free.
no question is too, too naive or too, no, just feel free. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yes. Majority and minority rule. Yeah. Right? But unfortunately, we are not told where they get out. <laughs> right? If you go to uh, Morocco, Morocco is a place where Jews, Christians, and Muslims get out of the world. Turkey, you see, you went to Turkey. Turkey was an amazing example. Let me remind you when when when, when the Christians, King Ferdinand, uh, kicked the Muslims out of Spain, what did the Jews do? They followed the Muslims in Spain. They said, you are kicking the Muslim today, we are next tomorrow. Yes. And they left Spain and followed the Muslims to the caliphate of Muslims in Turkey, and till today they exist in Turkey. So it's sad. And that's why we, we get together, we work together, and I just told you about this um, Islamic monarch that we as Muslims, we do not support. And you don't know that. Right? So we need to talk, we need to speak out, and uh, uh, how is it that we are not having understanding and harm? Right? I listened to the speech or one of the speeches of Bannon the other day. Oh. Ah, in Europe. Oh my God. It sounds like Pope Urban the second raising the monarch for the crusade. Yeah. Yeah. That's how he sounded. We cannot afford a crusade. <coughs> as Muslims, as Christians, as Jews, as Hindus, we have so much blood in our hand. We cannot go down that way again. Blood has not solved our problem. Right? So, I'm, I, I share with you, I understand, and we're not going to deny it. We're going to say it exists, but hopefully with dialogue, talking, diplomacy, we can. Okay. Because it is the divine right that God has given any human being to worship God the way he wants, or the way she wants. It is not my business, it is not my government business, it is not my chief commander chief business to tell any one of us how to worship God. Yes, oh, there was one. All right, go ahead. Good morning, and Good thank morning. you very much well. for being here with us. Um, I am a little frustrated in my own Christian faith with the lack of information about Mary. And I'm just spellbound to hear that there's a whole chapter in the Quran. Could you tell us a little bit about that chapter? Sure. That chapter is, it tells us about, uh, uh, about Mary, that he comes from the glory, but let me get to chapter 18. It is the 19th, sorry, 19th, it's chapter 19, okay? Mary comes from a very, very uh, noble family. That was in the, in, the, in, the, in the priest that was in charge of the temple. Okay? And Zachariah was in charge of him. Oh, oh, sorry. Zachariah was going to bring the food. So one day he, he came in to bring the food for, uh, before I have to go for the birth, when, when, when Mary's mom was pregnant. And when she delivered, she delivered a lady, a girl. So he thought, God, you've given me a girl. That says, of course we know we give you a girl. <laughs> but we raise her. Okay? So I skipped out because I wanted to give you that one. So when Zakanga came and brought the food to her, he saw Mary has fruits. Fruits that were even out of season. He said, Mary, where did you get that? She said, God provided. She said, God provided. Right? So then when it was at one time the angel appeared in front of him while she was retiring in, in the East Park. And the angel told her, Mary, God had decided we would have a son. She went berserk. 
He said, what are you talking about having a son? I have no boyfriend, I have no man, I don't know anybody. What are you talking about? I'm a changed woman. You better be careful and don't come close to me. <laughs> he said, no, I am an angel. I am an angel. God has decreed you will have a son and you will be mighty prophet. Mm -hmm. So retreat to the east of giving seclusion. And he did it. And at the time of delivering the pain of, of, of childbirth, he said, oh God, I will that never happen. <laughs> and in the Quran, God revealed, shake the date, tree, the palm tree, the dates will fall, and he, and that again is scientific. Today we know that date extract is very rich in oxytocin, that is a mighty muscle power, stimulant that we should have. Interesting. Very interesting. And though Jesus is gone, he is behind the name. And he comes out with a child, you can imagine that conservative Jewish community. They went berserk now. Oh Mary, what did you do? You dishonored the Aaron family that you need to come from. You dishonored them. And he says, don't talk to me. Talk to the baby. Talk to the This is in the Quran, right? This is in the Quran. Say, don't talk to me. Talk to the baby. The baby is they say, are you insulting our intelligence? We talk to the baby, the baby just, mm -hmm. I am a messenger of God brought to you. I'm here to lead you in a storm. <laughs> That's what we know of Jesus. And good to know that since you asked me, like, what is the historical importance of that when Muslims were very severely persecuted in Mecca, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told them, go to Abyssinia where there is a righteous Christian king, and he will not treat you with cruelty. Go there. When they went there, they, they got asylum there, and the, 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 the courage, local Arabs, already sent the ambassador and say, return them, they are prisoners of war. And Jaffa, a companion of the Prophet, if they, uh, they got the place with him, he recited to Mary. He recited the chapter of Mary when the Christian king asked him, what is your religion? What are you talking about? He recited that, and he took his, his, his staff and walking and he draw a line. He said the difference between you Christ, uh, Muslim and us a uh, Christian is no thicker than that line. That's a very historical uh, uh, event. And the Prophet Muhammad will return the favor when the delegation of the of Christians of Najran came to visit him in Medina and it was this morning, Sunday morning, they had to pray and they didn't have a place to pray. He offered them he offered them their home. And this was the understanding, the respect that they had. They are our teachers, ladies and gentlemen. They are our teachers. And we have some solo orals. Yes, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for coming. Well, what? Can you, uh, can you speak a little bit to a lot of the misconceptions I think that many Christians have about a differentiation between how men and women are brought up in the Muslim faith, different roles that they have? Absolutely. To know the answer, we have to differentiate between culture and religion. I'm not going to deny that. There are many, many places where men dominate women, that is not so. If women cannot drive in Saudi Arabia, please, don't blame yourself. So. Mm -hmm. In the Saudi Arabia. Right. If a daughter who has been raped is killed in Pakistan, do not blame Islam. It is the tribal culture of honor killing. Mm -hmm. We need to know that. The Quran is very clear, chapter 4, verse 1. We have created you, a man and a woman. And from that we have made many men and many women who are equal. You have been created from the same essence, the same material. I remind you that in Islam, Eve is not blamed. Government, <laughs> 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 forgive me. I <laughs> don't need to do that. <laughs> okay, but you have to know that. You know, Islam came to give women the right that they never had. Not only in Arabia, but around the world. If you look at the British Inheritance Act, do you know what a woman in Britain could inherit property? No. 900. Yeah. The Muslim counterparts did it after the Quran was revealed 1500 years ago. Yeah. Okay? Women were object of sex, and I'm afraid they still are. But 
it's like he just got that. So I say, honor the womb. Four, one, honor the womb that bore him. Honor that womb. Women didn't have right. Arabia was such in decadence that when a father died, his eldest son would get married his wife. All this stuff. You look like your mother from the back. And that would be enough to put that woman. The Quran came and condemned that. Say, so stop that. So, culture, yes. Culture, yes. Not the same. And that's why you have to be very careful. One time I was talking to a Christian congregation and make them understand that. And I said, if you see a Chinese Christian, you see a Chinese Christian eating with a stick, you don't come to California and publish in the paper. Jesus says to eat with a stick. Right. You don't. You have to differentiate, I'll come to you, you have to differentiate between the Chinese being a Christian and the Chinese culture eating with a, with a stick. Right. Have to differentiate the two. Yes, ma'am. Just a quick follow up. Can you clarify whether women can be leaders in the church? Or can be imam? leaders? Yeah, like an imam, for example. Yes. If we go in our tradition, one of the greatest scholars of Islam, his name was Aisha. And I've been pleased with her. They said this woman would have like maybe 10 PhDs put together. That's how powerful. She's our teacher. She's our teacher. We learn so much from her. Absolutely, a woman can be leaders. And when I was in the president of the Islamic Society of East Bay, most of our committees were led by women. They were very active. They still are very active. Okay. But to lead a prayer, we have some. They can lead among women. Okay. But to lead a, a prayer with the first, I'm going to be very detailed now. We have personal hygiene. Okay. Islam respect the, 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 the menses. And when the women are menses uh, during the period, they are exempt from prayer. Otherwise, you know, we pray five times a day. But when they are within that, now today we have this, uh, uh, what do they call it? This, uh, Hormonal disturbance that we understand the mood, the flexion of mood, and we ad 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 address that with the menses. Well, the Quran also ad ad recognized that a long time ago. That in that time, the woman needs to be. Prophet is with Muhammad, peace be upon him, told us how he was close to his wife when they went their menses. How he be with them. How he supported them because of their mood changes. Okay? So, because of that, they don't take that heavy responsibility of praying. Because of the action that we do when we pray, we bend forward. We bend on our knees, we go down. We don't want that. I don't think many women, many Muslim women will not be comfortable bending down to have so many men behind them. And I, as a man, I will not be comfortable with a woman bending in front of me when I'm talking to God. When I do this, see how we start our prayer? This, what does that mean? Listen. Surrender. Um, I'm surrendering from the world. When I say Allah wa Akbar, I don't want anything to distract me. I don't want anything to distract me. Whether a woman with the music, anything, with the food. And that's why I it. But absolutely, there are leaders in the masjid. I remind you that there are many, many organizations. You will have a lady coming on the fourth uh, presentation, Moina Shaikh. What she's doing is amazing. As a single woman, meet the Muslim project she has. She has a meet. Muslim. I won't talk about it, that's why that she will talk about it, but you'll be surprised to see as one Muslim what she can do. Alright? So you go to Al Azhar University, you will see how many Muslim teachers who are women. You'll be surprised. Okay? So there are absolutely, absolutely. You can, but you can. The only part that you can is to lead the prayer. But they can lead prayer with women, is no problem. Okay, the, 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 the segregation of the sexes is very, very important, uh, especially when we pray. That's very important. Yes, yes, sir. So, my understanding is 60 years ago, yes. 60 years ago was the last time they discovered one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that in the last couple of weeks, they discovered another that I believe contains the Ten Commandments. I'm wondering if something like this wouldn't be an opportunity to educate people who haven't had the benefits in the United States 
of this common tradition and common scripture that we share because they're not, they're not getting it at school, they're not getting it from television. I think a lot of people have no idea of what you're telling us. So the question becomes, how do we let those people know in a non-threatening way? I think we are doing what, we're, what we are doing is the right thing to do. And that's why I'm so grateful for my heart. I'm so grateful that you allow me here. I'm so grateful. Because that's what you need. Uh, somebody picked me up from the public library of Castro Valley. I was talking to him. He immediately invited me to be, to, to be a church. I think that's why we need to have conversation. We need to have dialogue. And research needs to be continued scientific research. Archaeological research needs to be done. Needs to continue. And this is what will bring us. But the most important thing is we talk. Mm -hmm. We talk with an open mind, and we are not, we should not. You should not be, uh, become afraid that I come here and I will convert you. I should not be afraid that when you come, when you invite me here, you will convert me and make me a Christian. <laughs> and I think that's a barrier that we have. If we lift up that barrier, you respect my opinion, I respect your opinion. You may, oh, you're welcome to disagree with me. I did not come here to say that you have to agree with me. We have to respect, we have to learn how to disagree. We have to agree to design, right? So as long as we do that, and we know there is an element of truth, what is bad is when we denigrate the religion, any religion. When you call people from any religion, they are murderers, they are killers, that's what is wrong. When you burn a sacred book, whatever book it is, when you in public you call for a burning of a sacred book, that is wrong. That is wrong. You don't have to believe in it. Don't have to agree with you, but as I said, it's a divine gift that God has given us. But I agree with you, we need to talk more. We need to make more research. Yes, Madam Yes, uh, it occurs to me that much of our culture has been enriched by Muslim or Islamic art. Muslim and Islamic art has been integrated into our culture, and I wonder if there is some place in Fremont or the East Bay where those of us who are interested in art, architecture, music could go, uh, like a museum for instance, to further that uh, spiritual side, an artistic side. Okay, uh, very good question. No, we don't have a museum, to be, but you could visit a lot of, of mosque, a lot of things, and once in a while we do have some, uh, I think uh, a while ago there was something in the San Francisco library that had to do with Islamic uh, arts and, 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 and expressions, and uh, calligraphy is one of them, that is a beautiful thing that you can learn, uh, the, the Arabic calligraphy, and the Chinese calligraphy, <laughs> yes, and then you have the use of archery, that's very, very, very Islamic. You will see, I'm not, that's my weak point, I'm not, I don't know much about architect, right? But all I know the use of arches. Yeah. But you have to see, medicine was influenced. Absolutely. Ibn Sina. Ibn Sina. Adaros. Ibn Rush. They were all Muslims. The word chemistry came from Muslim alchemy. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. So absolutely, so I will have to catch sometimes some PBS, sometimes there are some exhibitions that travel around, but we do not have a museum as you are calling it a museum. Hopefully, I know uh, 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 the, the founder of Zaytuna, uh, 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 Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, was very interested in that project of making a, a, a museum of Islam in America. I don't know if that will be uh, or not. It's a, it's a, extensive project, hopefully we'll do it one day. But meanwhile, yes, you can visit, you can arrange, now that you have, you know, Muni Yusafi, you know me, if you are interested to get a group to go, we will get you, we will get you busy. There are some beautiful, beautiful, most of our places of, of worship called masjid are not built as masjid. They were, they bought a place and they, they converted. But there are some places like Fremont, like Haywood, those are built Right, the, Hay the, the, the Haywood one has an amazing calligraphy with tiles that came from, from the people of the part of Afghanistan. And they brought somebody from Afghanistan to do that. It's a very beautiful, beautiful piece of, of architecture. Absolutely, anytime. Absolutely.
Yes, right now. We'll come to you. I just wanted to um, thank you for sharing your joyful love of the Quran with us and spreading understanding so that we can all have more cultural understanding. And I think perhaps that the favor that we should do in return is remind the world that our scripture also calls us to welcome the stranger and to serve the poor, the widow, and the orphan. Absolutely. It's a very good, uh, and I think that's to address your question and that question, if I can say that, on an average basis, on an average, a Muslim knows a lot about Christianity and Judaism, but the reverse is not true. And I think that's what I understand. See, a Muslim knows a lot. We know a lot about about Christianity and that. So we need to we need to address that. Yes, and then we go in the back, and then we'll come to you. Yes. Um, this is just a curiosity of mine. You mentioned the difference between culture and religion. Mm -hmm. So I've been curious to know whether the hijab and the uh, and all those other coverings that women sported as, as Muslims, is that culture or is that a Quran dictated? So it's, it's a combination of both. The, 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 the covering, the, what you call the niqab, is it the covering, right? Mm -hmm. That's not Islam. That's culture. Yeah. Most scholars say no. The hijab, covering the head, yes. That's part. And it's easy. As Christian, you understand that. I have many times I've talked to my Christian friends and I say, why don't you show me? A picture of Virgin Mary with the head front. Yeah, right. Good point. So why don't you show me a picture? We need the job lessons. You know, keep her hair fronting right now with the best of uh, shampoo and yoga and all that. So, and I went one day. Father Jeff invited me to the uh, uh, to the uh, what is it? Vespers. And I sat down and listened to the Vespers. I think Paolo. Sisters of the Dominican Order, I believe. And I say, how come people don't understand each other? Yeah, so look at those sisters. Yes, so how come they have problems? Right? So this is not Muhammad, the hijab. Even this is what I'm wearing. It's not Muhammad. But what has happened? The, the, the Jews have put it only to the rabbi and the Christians only maybe to the cardinal and the pope right. and we put it all the time. It's not compulsory, but it is part of the religion. Okay? It's very part of the religion. So the covering, yes, for the woman, okay? and the covering of the, the, the whole thing, because Islam is about respecting women, not making women an object of sex. And if we are true and honest today, Right, man. We, we are shaving. Quite a naked woman has to do. Almost naked woman has to do without the shaving. You tell me. You tell me. This is a product for men to use. Why you put me an almost naked woman on there? Why? And that's what Islam is all about. Respect women. Their body, the color of the body, reserved to their husband. And I, I can tell you, they, they they do dress. They do dress inappropriately in front of their husband in the privacy of their home, not in public. Not in public. One day I was on a cruise and I was on an island, and boy, <laughs> I, I was playing some soccer with my, with my son, having one son, and playing soccer, and my wife was reading a book on one of those, when you pull up. So she's coming. So the, the cruise guy who was there, I guess, even so he walked straight to my wife, and he said, man, Every woman is in the beach and enjoying the water. What are you doing here? What are you doing? My wife tells her, I walk up to him. I say, Sir, can I talk to you one minute? He says, Yes. I say, You pass by me and you miss me. I say, You pass by me. I am the only man with a long pair of pants and not in the water. You miss me, you went straight to my wife. Why? I say, Did you see what the media make you? Oh. He was apologetic. And I tell you, I said, this should have happened on the first day of the cruise. Every night we're getting something special in the room. <laughs> <laughs> he felt so bad. He felt so bad. But it's true. Right? So what is bad for the woman is bad for the man. It's not that I can come and I go and flood, I go and drink, and go and disco and do thing, and my wife can help me. It's not that. It's not that my son can date. And my, my daughter cannot date. It's not that. What 
is forbidden to the woman, is forbidden to the man, and vice versa. Right? So, absolutely. And, 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 yes? Yeah, I have a, a comment and question. Uh, first of all, Marty, I think that the uh, Asian Art Museum in San Francisco has a Middle Eastern section. They do. They do. Yeah, Muslim. okay. Right. And so my question is, you know, we, we, we learned that uh, Mecca was founded by Abraham, which would have been you know, centuries before the birth of Christ or um, Muhammad. So what um, religious tradition did the inhabitants of Mecca have before Muhammad? All right, so that's a very historical back in the history. Mecca was a very, very isolated place. It is a landlock. You have only two places. You have Jeddah and Sea, and then you have the uh, Syria. Otherwise, it's a landlock with arid mountain. Nothing grew there. Nothing grew there. Abraham and the divine order took it. And again, that's a difference between Christianity and, 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 and uh, Islam and the Bible and the, and the Quran. We, we respect our universities. But we believe that under divine, uh, not because of the fights between the, the wives, but because it was a divine commandment, God instructed Abraham to take than to, to Mecca. And they land in Mecca. And Hajar looked at Abraham and said, tell me one thing before we believe that Abraham was living. And he said, tell me one thing. Are you leaving us here on your own? Or did God instruct you to leave us here? He said, God instructed me to leave you here and God will take care of you. And he left. So then what came this uh, ritual, this uh, the, the water of the Zamzam, the, the well, and uh, Hajar was running crazy between the two hills, or hillocks, if you can call it, Safa and Marwa, right? And that's what we do when we go to Hajj. We repeat what Abraham and his family did. Yeah. So she was running back and forth, climbing up to see if there was any caravan coming, until the spring pop up, the well pop up. And then later Abraham came again, and again he will have a vision that God told him to sacrifice his son. And again, in the Islamic tradition, it is Ishmael, and the biblical tradition is uh, Isaac. Okay? But he got that vision and he does it. That's the second phase of, of, of the history. And the third part is when God ordered Abraham and Ishmael when he was big enough to build me the first house of worship for human beings. And that is the Kaaba. Okay? That's where the Kaaba is. And from that the tradition came on and then the tribe started, people started living around Mecca, around the Kaaba. And the caravan would come and then it would evolve in a tribal uh, society, in a very tribal society. And as time passes by, they will forget the teaching of Abraham, which was only the worship of one God. Okay, the, the, we told in the Quran, Abraham disagreed with his father. I don't know if in the Bible you have the same uh, narration. But he disagreed, he opposed his father. His father was a sculptor of the idols. And he right. disagreed and lived his father in peace, in respect, when he leaves his father to worship the one God. So that developed, then we'll have those many societies, many as tribes that will develop, there will be powers, they have their own organization as tribal organization, and they rule basically the, the importance of Mecca around the Arab was amazing because of Abraham. And every day they would come for pilgrimage in Mecca. And that and 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 God became a business. God became a business. Mecca was open for bidding. And the more you pay, your God getting into the Kaaba. Right. If your God getting into the Kaaba, that's a good status. That's why when Muhammad came, peace be upon him, and he told her there's only one God, no 360 gods. But at the time he came, the one God became 360 gods. And that's what God came. So basically that's that's the tradition of the of the of the Arabs in Mecca in short. So we just have time for one more question. Yes, yes. I'd like to add my thanks to everyone. Uh, everyone's for you uh, to be here and talk with us. Is there a protocol for visiting a mosque? How can we arrange to do that? What? Is there a protocol oh. for visiting a mosque? Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you can visit any time. You just oh. have to let them know. And like I said, even though you want, you can talk to Muni, you can talk to <laughs> We will arrange that. Uh, I would prefer, personally, people like to go on Friday. It depends where you go to. If I go to Fremont, uh, on Friday it's chaos. 
<laughs> if you want to see Friday, you can see Friday. But otherwise, I discourage Friday. I say, let's go. I usually take them. There was a prophecy in the, in the GTU in Berkeley, in Hollywood, so Berkeley. He used to bring his class to me. And we used, I used to meet between the, the late afternoon and the early prayer. It's very quiet. So if you want to get to know the mass, uh, you know, then you come at a time where it is quiet and you can take a tool, you can do that, you can have questions and answers. Okay. On Friday, you won't have time to do that. No, right. Friday, on average, it is overpacked. If you can pack 500 people, you see people on the stairs, you people outside praying. Mm -hmm. If you want to get a side of that, you're most welcome to come. But if you want to really explore and do, I discourage Friday because it's not, it's a busy time. And on top of that, we sell food. We have food. Our food is, everybody's buying food, rushing to go to work and this and that. So anytime, anytime I leave my, my, uh, my card here, and I will leave my card here. But any of you, my email, you know, you know my last name, Rajabali. So it's mrajabali at hotmail.com. Okay, I'll leave my card here for any one of you who Okay? Uh, and uh, don't worry, I won't give you a noble cane. <laughs> By the way, I practice with my wife, and that's what I was talking about. I can conclude with that. And I, one time, David Slim was talking, and I said, I said, why, why, why don't you tell me my wife? She's a Muslim. She covers. She's a doctor. She drives her own car. Why do you go to somewhere in Pakistan or somewhere in the mountains of Afghanistan? You know who is a Muslim woman. There's one right there in three months. Right. <laughs> you don't want that yeah. You just don't want to see that palm. Exactly. Right? Every Muslim woman was very how strong are they women? Alright? <laughs> right? So <laughs> and they are very strong. So but uh, yes, anytime please give me, we will arrange it. Okay. And Depending on what you want. If you want to see the Friday, we'll take it for the Friday. And if you want to see the, 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 the sting down and how we can talk, we will have that. Please give me a call. Thank you. And let me know.